joined by a very special guest. Please welcome Stephen T. Siegel. How are you guys doing? <laughs> doing doing well. How about you? Welcome to Collider Heroes. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. And you are here for many reasons. You have an incredible body of work, but specifically, you have a book called Get Naked. What? <laughs> A series of graphic essays, which came out last year, but is nominated for two, count them, two Eisner Awards? That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I wanted to see if essays could be comics. I like lots of different things. I We talked just before I started in the 80s doing, like, small press black and white. I've done X-Men. I've done, you know, image books, vertigo books. I'm all over the place. So I thought, how much more over the place can I get? Let's try essays. And we did. 19 I travel essays of different places I got naked. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wanted to see that, but here it is. It's nominated both for best, both for best humor publication and for best short story for Get Naked in Barcelona. Yeah, I don't know what made Barcelona so special to be naked in, but that was the one. I think it was the relatability of the sports stuff, <laughs> our, our true fear, <laughs> except for Koi. I mean, I live live. I got a Burning Man. You guys got to make choices. <laughs> but what, what I love about the book is that it immediately, like, page one, naked. Like, it, yeah. draws, there's no warm up. There's no foreplay, so to speak. <laughs> you're like, you're in, and the book instantly feels relatable. That's the exact word I'd use. Everyone has one or many stories. They're like, well, I've had that feeling. When you were writing it, did you cite other people? Did you have conversation? Like, how did this book come together? Uh, well, that's a complex question. I mean, first of all, is I, I don't think I was naked anywhere until I was about 30. Uh, honestly, I was a scrawny kid. I was, you know, told from a young age that people would put their hand around my arms and be like, I can touch my fingers. I'm like, that doesn't seem good. Uh, so I just, I literally, I was cloaked. I, w I was dressed for Handmaid's Tale in the mail since <laughs> before there was such a thing. I, I didn't wear a short sleeve shirts. I never wore shorts because uh, I was, I was just never going to be seen. Uh, and then when I turned 30, I developed this heart condition and I had to start swimming all the time. And when you swim, one way or another, unless you can do that towel mambo that some people do, it's going to come off. And I was like, oh, what was I so hung up about? And then I started traveling a lot and uh, just wound up, as the book points out, naked in various places. And I thought, uh, well, that's weird. I don't kind of feel freaked out about this anymore. When did that change happen? And it didn't happen in America was the answer. Mm. So I wrote 19 essays about 19 different countries where they just kind of have different feelings and vibes about us. You know, it's just not a big thing anywhere except the U.S. for the most part. Uh, and the main answer to your question is I, I wanted to do essays. Like I love David Sedaris, I love Spalding Gray, I like mm -hmm. just performance monologue stuff and essay stuff, but I'd never seen it in comics quite that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and about five years ago, I was thinking, well, what would an essay look like in comics form? And I hate comics that have too many words, mm -hmm. even though a lot of mine do. Uh, but uh, and I was like, well, an essay is going to have even more. And how do you solve this problem? And I couldn't. I just sat with Photoshop, moving stuff around, trying to figure it out, never came up with a good solution. Uh, but I teach at a school in uh, Vibor, Denmark, called the Animation Workshop. And those students, uh, they have three majors, comic books, animation, graphic, computer graphics. Uh, and I teach the graphic novel course a bunch. Uh, and the students did a session with some other teacher on journalistic comics, mm -hmm. and they post them online. And I was like, this has a lot of text, but it's still a comic, and I would read this. So then I pitched the school, I'm like, I want to do essays. Can we just make it an assignment? And if it turns out really great, we'll publish it at Image. And if it doesn't turn out great, it was an assignment. And it turned out great. <laughs> so we published it. Were your students like, all right, this is either homework or my first credit? What was that like? Yes, that's exactly what it was like, I think. You'd have to ask them. But uh, no, the, uh, well, the weird thing was that it was get naked. So I knew it would be essays, but I didn't know what. I have a lot of weird family stories. Like my dad was mistaken for Richard Nixon by the Secret Service wow. and carted away because they thought he was the president, uh, <laughs> not because he wasn't the president. And then he spoke and he's from North Carolina. He's like, I don't think you got the right guy. And they're like, ah, it's not Nixon. <laughs> so I was like, I read well, that these... book in a second. <laughs> right? And th that's, I was like, I'm going to tell those stories. But then I thought, it's hard enough selling an essay. I'm definitely not going to sell an essay about my family per se. I've either got to have the word sex naked or gun in the title to make an impact in the U.S. <laughs> and naked gun was taken. Naked gun was taken. So <laughs> I, I was like, I don't think I've ever been naked. Uh, and then I started thinking of all these places I had been naked. And I was like, oh, this is weird. Why, why are there all these stories? So I wrote all 19 of those and read them all to the students the first day. I'm like, here they are. Find one that speaks to your soul or that you can at least stomach. You can draw me naked or not draw me naked. I'm not going to pose naked for you, but that's up to you. <laughs> Uh, and they each picked a story that was, they're all from different countries too, so some of them picked a country they were from, or some picked a country they weren't from, uh, and they just, I said, there are no rules, just make it not boring, uh, and I'm going to check in with you every day, on a page a day, in 10 days we're going to knock this book out, and we did it in 10 days. No. Wow. 10 days, and then we spent three and a half months polishing it, but literally 180 pages of that book were done in 10 days. 
That's a incredible. round of applause to your artists. They were yeah. amazing. That's oh my big round. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. Uh, so you're working in, like, nonfiction comics has become one of the strongest areas of comics. Yeah. Um, but typically with folks like Joe Sacco doing reportage or Lucy Knightley mm -hmm. doing memoir, people are yep. doing their own thing. I feel like it's only like Harvey Picard and others who have taken their sort of autobiography and seen a bunch of different people take it on. Uh, what, were, what was it like getting back 19 versions of your own life? <laughs> Weird. Uh, first of all, no one who drew me naked drew me massively endowed. And I was like, how did you know that? Um, <laughs> So that was a little sad. I thought somebody would at least, you know, try to get the A, you know, enhance something. It's a very specific assignment that where that's an happen. option. That doesn't happen often. Uh, not often. And my wife was like, "You're do wait, they're drawing what? Uh, it was, it was, it's always weird. I did another book for Vertigo called It's a Bird, which was autobiographical semi. Uh, yes, for about which your artist Eddie Christensen, I think, won the Won the Eisner. Eisner, yeah. And I was nominated, but didn't win. It's a theme for me. I'm Susan Lucci, but I'm comic books. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, he didn't win for a while. That's right, that's right. Holding out, hope. kill the bear. Uh, surely essays will turn that around. Uh, but that book was about my family's history with Huntington's disease and why it made me not love superheroes in a weird way. Uh, it's also about how much I don't like Superman. And then DC published it. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> thanks. That was great. But it was that was for me. That was the real dive into the deep end because it was very personal. And even though abstracted, there were things that I had to say about my family and my parents and my brother and you know my aunt who died of Huntington's disease that needed to be kind of just truthful. And I hadn't, I, I always infused myself in my work, but not literally. And so that was a, a challenge for me. So that this, Get Naked, seemed like, ah, that's a walk in the park. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's awkward and embarrassing, which I'll, I tell those stories to anybody anyway. Uh, and so it didn't seem quite so shocking. So I'd like, I'd like to do more and tell my Nixon stories and whatever, but I don't know how much me the world needs in comics. You and I were talking right before air about the evolution of digital versus print, and I feel like we've seen, especially in the last five years, the rise of books like this being an option. I, I don't know how long ago this would have been a, a book that could have been published, and like we, uh, Bendis as well covered like what David Mack's doing with art and like the mm -hmm. way you're reshaping what the narrative is. How have you felt being inside comics as we've hit this new kind of digital renaissance where there's a lot of bold choices being taken? Yeah, well, the first bold choice, kudos, goes to Image, because I publish everything I do through Image now, and I'll, I'll show up one day and I'll be like, I want to do Camp Midnight for 10 year old girls and Eric Stevenson's like do it and I come back a year later and I'm like I want to do 19 essays about taking my clothes off he's like do it uh, and I think that it's the willingness of publishers to take that risk like it's a bird Paul Levitz could have said he did say he's like no more DC heroes and vertigo books and I'm like can I just do Superman for one and he was like okay you know, it takes it takes that person who's willing to take the risk and then the book has to be good as good as you can make it and so those two things I, I think comics is a medium and you can tell any kind of story in comics, we hopefully know that by now, but it's the risk financially of will that comic sell? And if it doesn't, will there be another one? Like this is the first book I've seen of essays. If it doesn't get out of the red, then it will be the last book we see of essays. You know? So it's, it's both of those things. But I think there are publishers usually willing to go out on a limb if they believe in the work. And you've never been afraid of, of experimenting and trying no. new things. <laughs> Quite uh, the opposite. <laughs> From the biggest names to making your own thing from scratch, like a certain series, some of our folks oh. at home might, like, can you talk a little bit about moving between those worlds and how you landed in animation? Well, yeah, so Man of Action, which is my company with Joe Kelly, Joe Casey, Duncan Rulo, three other comic book nerds like myself, uh, started accidentally. It literally, this is a terrible story to tell, but it started because we were tired of walking around San Diego Comic-Con. <laughs> Literally. And so one of, the, one of the Joes, maybe Joe Kelly, was like, we should get a booth and sit down and watch it walk by us. <laughs> and we're like, well, how much is a booth? And back then it was 400 bucks or something. We're like, hey, it's 100 bucks ahead, and then we don't have to walk through this thing. So we literally <laughs> filled the paperwork, and then uh, they were like, well, what's the name of your company? We're like, we don't have a company. And so Joe Kelly was like, uh, we're called Evil Geniuses. And they're like, we already have an Evil Geniuses. We're like, then we're called Man of Action. So we had this booth and it was Man of Action. It was just to literally buy comics and hide them behind the table and sit down when you were tired. <laughs> and somebody walked up while we were there the first year and they're like, Man of Action, what do you do? And we're like, uh, we're writers. And they're like, oh, do you write short films? And we're like, sure. <laughs> and so they hired us to write four short films, which only one got made, but one got made. The next year we sit down again. Somebody's like, Man of Action, what do you guys do? We're like, we write comics and short films. And they're like, oh, do you do video games? We're like, yes. <laughs> And they're like, okay, you all wrote the X-Men, so we're going to hire you to write this X-Men video game. I'm like, okay, cool. The That's third year, happens. well, and now here's the worst part, or the best. The third year, we sit down, and they're like, man of action. It was, it was Matt Sinreich from Robot Chicken, who's 
nearby here somewhere. He's like, man of action, you guys do uh, cartoons, right? We're like, yes. <laughs> He's like, oh good, Cartoon Network wants like a boys action show and that's not really what we do, but you do that, so go talk to them. And we talked to them and we sold them Ben 10. Oh my God. Wow. We had never worked on a cartoon before, none of us. <laughs> So internet, sometimes buy the cart before the horse and sometimes. get the horse. <laughs> That's incredible. Well, uh, that X-Men game was like one of the notable best Marvel games. Like we Hard all stop. remember yeah. that coming out being like, it can be this good. Like, and that was just y'all being like, sure, yes, we do that. Uh, we, yeah, I mean, we, we wrote the script for that, which was like seven or 900 pages or something ridiculous. Uh, and then Raven developed and kind of did all the hard parts. <laughs> Um, but we'd all, we had worked on X-Men, and the one thing that unites all this stuff is what's, what's a good story? And it's a couple of things. It's that you've got to give the audience something. You know, not just a bunch of plot details, something. They've got to leave with something. So if you read Get Naked, I'm hoping you leave with a sense that if you're like me and a super self-body phobe, you can get over that. That's the moral of all of those stories is there's awkward stuff, there's weird stuff, but you can put your mind at ease and just be yourself. That's possible. So that's what I'm giving people in exchange for their 25 bucks or whatever that book costs. With Ben 10, it's telling kids, you know, you don't need 10 different superpowers to get through something. You need to think. Hmm. You know, sometimes that's Gwen. Sometimes Ben has an epiphany. Sometimes Max tells them. But that's what unites those stories. So it's, it's getting at what, what does somebody leave with as an audience member? What do you have to offer the world? And that's no different if it's a video game, a cartoon, a comic book. And we'd all learned our, learned our chops, that doesn't even a thing. Learned our skill sets doing comics. We had honed our chops? There's a chops metaphor here, I don't know what it is. We'd all eaten pork chops while working <laughs> as writers. Um, and it's just kind of applying that skill set. There was stuff we had to learn about cartoons that we absolutely didn't know. We've worked on films, we worked on TV shows. You always go, oh, this is different. It's not just writing, I have to have a different toolbox. Mm. Were there so. any particularly funny memories of making the, the animation or, or film transitions there? Well, the, the best thing about the Ben 10 pitch was we're, we're four guys and we all have different, wildly different aesthetics and kind of things that interest us. And nobody wanted to commit to the one thing. We could not decide what should we pitch. So we pitched 20 things in 20 minutes. Wow. And we were like, well, it's too much, but we'll just take a stopwatch and we'll have a bell and we'll ring the bell at 60 seconds and just move on to the next thing. And so idea eight was Ben 10, but it was literally like somebody would just start a pitch, blah, 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 ding, boom, move on to the next one. So it was the craziest pitch I think Cartoon Network had ever heard. Did the meta quality of that being how Ben 10 happened? Like a million different versions? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, was they, they were like, there's something here. Well, they stopped us at eight. So number eight was this, they're like, that's it. That's what we want. And we're like, no, we're doing the rest. We worked hard on these things. <laughs> really? Yeah, so we finished all, all 20. <laughs> you listen to the next 12, we've got more to say. It was, we were a little indignant. Um, but then at that same 20, one of those was Generator X, one of those was Zack Storm, which is now on Netflix, and there's 17 more, which no one has ever That's asked That's incredible. Is there any of those other 17 you can safely mention? Because I'm fascinated by like what? There are, no, they're sellable, are you <laughs> I kidding? I was just hoping, I was hoping to hear one. Somebody needs to go. <laughs> yeah, by releasing information. We still have a stopwatch and a bell. Somebody needs to have the other 17 meeting. Absolutely. I mean, who knows what's in there? Now with this brain trust of writers, how is that, how has your shorthand evolved? How is this getting together and collaborating? Since you've been doing it for so long, has anything changed amongst, amongst you folks? Oh, a lot, yeah. It's 19 years this year wow. uh, that we've been doing Man of Action. Congratulations. Thank it's it's hard to imagine it's lasted that long and we're still trucking along um yeah we've so we bring in a lot more writers we have big writers rooms now we have kind of 55 to 60 freelance writers that we'll use to staff a season of a show and we bring in five or six of those at a time plus the four of us plus kind of our two main principal uh, full-time writer guys and that lets us get a better mix than just a bunch of white dudes sitting around so that's mm -hmm. been great we have learned to streamline things so whoever's holding the pen kind of is in charge of going, you talk, you talk, you talk, what did you say? Uh, and then they get to make the decision. So we've learned to just lay back and have ideas and let somebody else coalesce the ideas. Um, but mostly it's, the reason it's lasted is because we all know what's cool when we hear it. We don't always bring it, <laughs> like, <laughs> I have the best idea, and you spit it out and you're like, that was terrible. Uh, but somebody else in the room will go, no, that, that thing you said about the bison, let's stay on the bison. And so we've learned to trust whoever's feeling it to drive it. And that seems to be what works for us. So comics was the beginning. How did you first, like, what was the first comic you remember picking up? What was your collecting process? Do you still bag board and long box? Like, what's your comic? I book? have had a midlife crisis uh, called My Lights 2, oh. which is the most pretty comic book bag ever. Uh, and that has transformed, well, basically I don't see anyone anymore. I get home and I'm like, I'm going to put these 
books and these new bags. And then, <laughs> like you could literally put my ugly face in a My Lai too, and I'd look like Brad Pitt. It's just for, <laughs> they have changed my existence for the worse and the better. Uh, so I still collect comic books, mostly like old Silver Age Marvel and DC stuff. I, I now am in the fortunate place that all those books I couldn't afford, uh, not even expensive books like Defender 7, I mean, not, mm -hmm. you know, not like crazy Golden Age stuff. But uh, I can get those. It's just fun to fill up these runs. I have no time to read them, but it's like, yeah, <laughs> I got this. Now what do I do with it? Uh, so you I'm know, still doing that. You know, you could read them if you wanted to. I do. I have a stack by my bed called, you know, uh, I hope I break my foot soon so I'll be in this bed and can read all these books. <laughs> Um, but I just, I don't get to most of them. I'm reading Kill Raven right now from the 70s, nice. I want to say. And I'm, I'm, I've, I started it in January, and I'm on like the 7th or 8th issue. That's how much spare time I have. I have a weird thing with uh, Silver Age where I don't like to read them because they're from the, like the paper deteriorating. So I don't read my digitals that I own until I have the print <laughs> of the thing I own. So I'm like, That's I fun. now have access to my own books. I'm the opposite. Like I bought all the, here's the nice version of the library edition of Dada. I'm like, no, nah, I want to read the crappy. Flap <laughs> so, you want to smell the paper. I you want to look at the I ads. Do, I do. I'm you want to read the you want to smell yeah. it too. Like the Tactile. smell of Silver Age books is so important. Yeah. My first book was Avengers 89. I've told this story before, but my mom and dad bought it for me. They were in the Air Force. We were moving a lot. And they were like, this will make you happy that we've moved again. And it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> it was Captain Marvel's on the cover being electrocuted. And then there's creepy aliens and stuff. I was like, do not give me any more of these ever again. <laughs> I'm six years old. This is not for me. Uh, and then I took a big sabbatical until I was in junior high. And that's when I got back into comics. And now it's your life. And and now it. it's my life. Yeah. What do you prefer as far as the like the mediums? Do you, do you have a preference for? You've you've done so many things: video games, film. Is there a certain way you think about them differently? Is there a preference for like mode and mood? Like right now, you're balancing between handling cartoons and handling comic books. Is there something you like is more relaxing than others? They're like a neutral. The nice thing about comics is the kind of comics I do now, where I work through image, is me and an artist going. Here's what we're doing. And Image is not very aggressively hands-on about, you should do this instead. So it can be great in that I can just I have a vision, I work with an artist, whatever we get collectively decided, that's what we put out. It can also turn out badly because, you know, maybe I shouldn't do 19 essays about taking my clothes off. There's no one to go, don't do that. Uh, so you have to really self-monitor a lot. But it's, it's nice that it's this pure, if, if I could draw, I would love that. Like if I could just get an idea from my head onto a page, and I'm it. I love cartoonists like that can just do it all themselves. Hallelujah. Uh, but even two people is not a lot. As soon as you go to a cartoon, we're talking hundreds, mm. yeah. low hundreds. As soon as we go to a TV show, we're talking two or three hundred. As soon as we go to a movie, we're talking four or five hundred if it's a special effects movie. And I love all of that. Like it's it's all collaborative. And you, but you just have to go. This is you and me making a comic. This is all of us making an animated show. And it has to be all of you. It can't just be, even with a comic, I can't write a script and go, draw exactly what I've given you. It has to be give and take. You know, you have to go, what do you want from a script? What do you want to draw? I worked with Kelly Jones once, uh, who I love, and he was like, I don't draw horses very well. I'm like, we're doing horses. <laughs> You're gonna draw a lot of horses then. <laughs> you should, because he should, and then Has he loved he it. Has forgiven you? Okay. Yeah, no, he, it's, it's part what does he want, it's part what does he need, it's part what do I want, what do I need? And you've gotta, for the thing to be good, it's gotta make you grow, and if you're just doing what you always do, bleh. Is that why you've made so many twists and turns? From it, is, it is a great part of that. I try to mess my creative process up every year or two uh, and not do it the way I used to do it. The Camp Midnight books that I've been doing with Jason Katzenstein for Image, another one's coming out in October. Uh, I, always, I start at the end and I work backwards. So I go, here's what it's oh, about. How do I get there? For Camp Midnight, I started on page one with no outline. It was like, I hope I make it by the end of this book. And it terrified me, but at the same time, I made it. Uh, and so now on the second one, I'm like, I guess I have to write this one that way too, but I won't write any other books that way. So I'm always trying to go, how do I, how do I get at this differently? I think my toolbox is good, good enough to mess everything else up and hope I can survive. I'm doing a book with Teddy right now where he's just painting images. They're all exactly the same size and shape and I get them out of order. Huh? So I don't know what he's painting, but I get to decide the sequence and then I get to write the script and that's going to be the book. So neither one of us knows what we're working oh, on. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah, but it's terrifying. But it's uh, that's what I need after 30 years of doing comics is i got to terrify myself. Has there been a moment, like I know the Breaking Bad writers wrote themselves into corners at the end of every episode, so they had, they had that moment of like, ah. Uh, has there been a moment you've written yourself into a corner or gotten yourself stumped where you've had to revamp enough that it reshaped the entire book or the entire series? Well, not so much that because, again, I write backwards primarily. Sure. So I'm, it's more like, how do I start this as opposed to where does this yeah, go? Yeah, have you not gotten to the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> Guess is the well, the beginning is wide open. Like you can start an hour before something happens or a day or a oh. year. 
year yeah. or a decade or a generation. So it is, it's a question of how far back do you go to get to this moment uh, for a lot of what I do. But what I have done is I've done a couple of comics projects that for publishers going bankrupt or you know the project losing steam or losing an artist where the project dies and then I come back to it decades later and go, oh, I gotta put this brain back on and finish this thing or start it depending on the order of things. <laughs> So like Becky Cloonan and I did American Virgin for Vertigo. Mm -hmm. We just got the rights back, but Vertigo canceled it at 23 and it was four issue arcs. We never did issue 24. And everybody was furious. They're like, why would you kill him? And we're like, there was an issue 24. <laughs> oh, you wow. didn't see that. And I have an outline for it, but I didn't write it. So now I'm gonna go back and write that. You know, I don't know how long it's been, like seven, eight years or something, maybe 10. And I have to put in that head and go, oh, how did I think about this stuff? Because I don't work that way anymore. So is that, can we, that's happening? We're going to get the, the ending to that series at some point? Yeah, I don't even know it's the ending. You'll get the end of that arc. Okay. Yes. Becky and I are going to do it through image. We're just trying to find the time to get that issue done. Sure. Uh, and then, yeah. That's so cool. My last question for you, because your world of comics is so unique, and a lot of times it's hard to find like a gateway drug into comics. You, <laughs> you had a, a scary experience in the beginning, but is there any book you'd recommend to people that are trying to find their way into non-cape books? Mm -hmm. is, there any, is there any gateway yeah, drug? Yeah, right now I'm so all about my favorite thing is Monsters, yes. uh, which was last year's. I think it won a bunch of Eisner's last year. So not a traditional comic book. So not, I, I don't even know what I thought it would be, or what I don't even know that I would have found it, and I think somebody forced it on me, and I, I was like, oh, it's too many words. I don't think I can do scratchy art. And within about two pages, I'm like, I should just quit comics because <laughs> Emil Ferris knows what she's doing and I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, so it's about, a, you know, it's about a young girl who fancies herself a monster. And that's actually a really cool psychological metaphor for stuff that's happening in her bizarre part of the neighborhood and her weird brother and her mom and this murder that may have happened upstairs. Uh, and it's thick, it's like 300 pages and it's part one. So give me part two, Emil Ferris, where are you? Uh, but it's, it's a great book. All right, so please, you got to check out the collection Get Naked. It's up for best yeah. short publication and best short story. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. You all. And there will be a Get Naked podcast soon. Really? Oh, yes. Oh, interesting. They're all being read out loud and animated with the art. So check that out when it shows I, I up. I love how that's multimedia fantastic. your whole company is. How many different tiers? That's of, how we roll, baby. That's fascinating. And we didn't even have time to get into the X Men or no. like, you know a little thing called Big Hero Six. There is that. <laughs> next time. So next Down time. The street. Thank I'm you just so up much the block. for joining us. <laughs> thank you. It was great to be here. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, guys. Until next week, stay sweaty. <laughs>